<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, so uh, today is the 13th of March uh, 2022, and we'll talk about Karl Friedrich Schinkel, who was born on the, on the 13th of March in 1781. Um, so sometimes I'm a little bit confused, and I will be honest, because sometimes I, 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 I choose wrongly between the date of birth and the date um, uh, of, of death, uh, because in the case of someone who died, I talked twice about that architect. I hope I got it right that he was born on the 13th of, of March, but we will see now if, if I was correct or not. Uh, just a second. Unfortunately, I always have a problem. I, I, I don't know if it's my laptop or uh, it's uh, a problem with the Zoom. I, I don't see the, I cannot, it's probably with the, yes. Yeah, he was born the 13th of March, thank God. Uh, this time I was not wrong. So Karl Friedrich Schinkel, born the 13th of March, 1781, and died in, on the 9th of October, 1841. So when he died, he was 60. Was a Prussian architect, city planner, and painter, who also designed furniture and stage sets. Schinkel was one of the most prominent architects of Germany and designed both neoclassical and neo-Gothic buildings. His most famous buildings are found in and around Berlin. This is very interesting because, you know, perhaps nothing is as opposite to each other than uh, neoclassical and neo-Gothic or the classic, classical and the Gothic. But it's true in the case of Karl Friedrich Schinkel. He had a doubleness about him. It was like a, you know, schismatic personality. On one hand, he had dreams uh, which he painted for the Gothic cathedral. He had a romantic side that made him, uh, you know, uh, passionately uh, attracted towards Gothic architecture. On the other hand, what he built is not Gothic at all. It's, yes, we could say neoclassical, but it's, it's, it's still this, the neoclassicism of Schinkel is still colored, so to speak, by a romantic uh, sensibility, but is in, in no way neo-Gothic. A very interesting character. Also, uh, what is not said here, initially he wanted to become a painter. And he did paint all his life. He painted a lot, but uh, he gave up actually uh, the, the dream of becoming a painter. He arrived at the conclusion um, uh, that uh, he, he would never be a great painter. So he dedicated most of his efforts to, uh, uh, to architecture. So let's, uh, let's uh, see a few pictures with him. Uh, this is a drawing. Uh, I don't know who did it. Uh, I don't know if, he, if it's a self-portrait or not. Uh, probably not. Uh, a very interesting uh, architect and uh, yes, uh, revered in Germany and not only Germany. And also he was revered during the postmodern period at the end of the 20th century. Um, again and again, here we have an architect who was also a painter. I can, uh, I can uh, write down the names of many architects who were painters and architects. So, you know, again, you know, to be an architect, you do need to have an artistic side. There are a few exceptions, but very rare. Like, for example, Walter Gropius, he didn't, he didn't paint and also he didn't draw, but, uh, he, he, but he surrounded himself with, with painters. After all, the Bauhaus, which was supposed to be an architect, uh, in a way, an architecture school, well, he didn't hire any architects at first. He was the only one, but he surrounded himself with painters who taught in a school which was supposed to be in a certain way an architecture school. Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, Leonel Heininger, they were all painters. Anyway, back to uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel. Um, so let's look at some of his paintings. Uh, because he painted a lot. Of course, the Gothic Cathedral. 
he has uh, many works depicting uh, uh, i mean the gothic in itself is a, is a, is a, an idealized uh, you know form of architecture if we talk about architecture but in his case is even uh, it overemphasized the idealism of, of, of the gothic you see he he planted this is a, the a work of an imagination usually the gothic cathedral was not uh, you know on top of a hill uh, was in the middle of a city he often uh, brings the cathedral to close to water like we see here either sea or the river he, he was a dreamer of course and you know this shows is very possible he had a longing for god and the gothic uh, is the appropriate architecture to express this but in the 19th century there was a great neo-gothic movement particularly in great britain but he didn't he didn't build in that neo-gothic style if i am to call it a style again a gothic cathedral and uh, again mentioning again the fact that although he loved the gothic he loved to paint it but he built otherwise maybe he couldn't build in this way in germany i don't know anyway again another cathedral this is the third cathedral that we saw that we see being painted by Karl friedrich schinkel and they're all glorious uh, and uh, I, I myself uh, love the Gothic because I grew up in the shadow of the Biserica Evangelica, the Gothic uh, cathedral in Sibiu. And uh, it's in me, it's in my soul. So I'm, I'm very vibrant to, I, 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 uh, I, I sympathize with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel's uh, love for the Gothic. But it's not just the Gothic, it's also, for example, in some of his paintings, he shows the morning, which means the beginning of the day. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a, I don't know if he was a mystic, but he did have, um, you know, a uh, longing for, uh, for uh, uh, content, a content, an emotional, a mental content that, uh, extended beyond the measurable so you know the cathedral as the house of god then the sunrise as the the beginning of life in a way the life of a day but symbolically is life in general uh, he has also like beyond the gothic he had influences coming from other cultures like you see here but these are these are fantastic uh, these are imagined architectures. He, nobody asked him to you know, build something like this. Why did he do it? Well, because uh, he, he had a rich imagination and he, had, uh, he liked to invent things, to create uh, you know, uh, different architectures, even unfeasible architectures. I mean, unfeasible for the time he lived in. Nobody in the 19th century would build in this way. This was the work of imagination. Uh, this cathedral also, you know, uh, uh, at the edge of the city, uh, when we don't know what city, and the, and the ra rainbow also. So we have all kinds of symbolism here. We have the white flag there on top of the cathedral, which means peace. Then we have the rainbow, which means uh, you know the the the, the triumph of uh, of the mystery of, of light uh, and, and color after the rain. Um, you know, it, it's a symbolic uh, painting. This was Schinkel, an idealist, of course. And I keep saying we need idealism badly in architecture. And I'm talking about our country. In the absence of that idealism, we become uh, almost irrelevant. You cannot create significantly in the absence of some, at least some idealism. Um, 
Anyway, paintings by uh, Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Although he was an architect, here we see no building at all. But we see again the sunrise. You know, the, the light announcing and the children moving towards kind of, yes, moving towards the sunlight. It's a, it's a symbolic, it's a symbolic painting. Again, the cathedral, this is the fourth cathedral that he painted. Now, we are going to look at some of, uh, of his uh, most important buildings that he built. Not all of them, but I have here a comprehensive presentation of uh, uh, his most important works. We begin with this truly famous museum in Berlin, the Altes Museum, uh, which is a neoclassical, but I hesitate a little bit to use the word neoclassical. It is classicist, it's a classicist building, but I don't know, it's something about it which makes me a little bit hesitant to call it neoclassical, you know, to, to, to incorporate it rigidly into the, that architectural niche called the neoclassicism. It could be, it's not wrong, but I feel that the romantic sensi sensibility of Carl Friedrich Schinkel May, even if, yes, he uses, uh, you know, the regularity of rhythm here, there is, um, you know, by all canons, we would say this is a classical or classicist building. But I feel there is a romantic side to this, even to this building, that makes things a little bit, uh, um, in a way, more complicated. Maybe I am, I am influenced in my words, in my thoughts, by the darkness of the columns. I, when I saw the building, it was exactly like this, you know, uh, and I don't know if the Germans cleaned them up, but if they did it, didn't, I think they did the right thing. You know, these darkened columns, you know, classical columns, if we are to call them so, they are huge, as you can see, the human silhouettes, they are huge, but the fact that they are darkened by war, of course, the Second World War, mainly and the passage of time makes them uh, in a way, I don't know, what I say now is probably uh, questionable, less classical because they are dirty. And we usually associate the classic uh, or the, the classical with Apollo, with the God of light and, and you know, clean things, whiteness, well, <laughs> They are not white. So, you know, you could say this man is mad. He claims that what dirt is romantic. In a way it is because dirt implies, um, you know, uh, disorder in a way. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, in a way, yes, dirt is romantic. It's a romantic, uh, uh, you know, entity or how to call it. Anyway, it's a, it's a very important museum in the heart of Berlin. And here on the right is another building by him also by uh, Carl Friedrich Schinkel. I like this museum. Uh, whatever Wolf Briggs might say that he hated columns. In my opinion, these columns here are very powerful. And um, I don't consider them oppressive. Maybe because the building is very long and uh, you know, um, Yes, the columns are tall, but uh, the height of the building is about the height of the columns. It's rather horizontal, the building. This is a rendering, I think, done by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Now, it was much more white at the time. So maybe my, my uh, you know, uh, comments uh, are only, partially valid, that's not what I, he had in mind, Carl Friedrich Schinkel to, you know, rely on the romanticism of that. The plans, now the plans are, what can we say, almost predictable, no? I mean, you have a, a circular uh, big room in the center, and uh, well, on the model of the Pantheon in Rome, and uh, 
you know, uh, spaces, rooms around it. We are going to see, look at the section. Of course, this is a small uh, version of the Pantheon. Uh, I, I repeat, I reiterate, uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel was an architect very admired uh, in the, at the end of the 20th century when postmodernism had a few years of glory. Uh, here we see uh, the model of a building by Miss van der Rohe, uh, which he proposed for Berlin, but was not built. Uh, otherwise, of course, the, the, the room uh, it belongs to Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the Altes Museum. Again, this building behind on the right is also by Schinkel. He designed these two buildings and he, these are not the only ones in Berlin. He has others and we are going to see them. What I don't understand, you know, these columns are darkened probably by war as well. And, and right now there is this war in Ukraine. You know, it, it, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the Russians, lost millions of people in the Second World War. Easter is approaching. The Russians are believers. From what I know, uh, Russians do believe in God. So Easter is not far away. And they are waging a deadly war on those they claim are their brothers. They claim Ukraine, Ukrainians are Russian. So they're actually killing Russians. The Russians are killing Russians. That, you know, that is the claim that the Ukrainians are Russians. What's going on? I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you comprehend this madness, this criminal madness, you know? How to understand it? And we still claim that the, the human beings are rational? I think we are not at all. And we can expect the most horrible things to happen, really. You know, it, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. You know, two millions and a half refugees, women and children and all the people displaced. And who knows what will happen there? It's, it's just incredible. It, it, I, I don't comprehend. What does that Putin want? He has the largest country in the world in terms of land. He has Siberia, which will be the, the, the country of the future. Because if the climate keeps uh, warming up, obviously Siberia will become the only livable place in the world or uh, one of the very few. As somebody told me in 50 years, that's the place to be in, in Siberia, if temperatures keep going up. So what does Putin want? He wants even more land? That man should be brought down, really. And I don't know how, but it should be done. And the sooner, the better. It's, it's... And this man, is, 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 he goes to the church, the Orthodox Church, so powerful in Moscow and in Russia. Why doesn't the church say anything? I read that the, the patriarch Kirill uh, said that, uh, I read that he, he, he stated that uh, Putin also wages a war against uh, homosexual parades in Ukraine. That's why you kill people? Because you protect, protest against some uh, parades? It's just unbelievable the corruption at the highest level is immense. These people should be in prison, including the Kirill, Kirill Pat, Patriarch. They should be in prison. And I was actually very happy that uh, apparently the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the person who talks in the name of the Romanian Orthodox Church uh, had the critical uh, statements about Kirill as well. I only hope they were sincere. Anyway, back to Karl Friedrich Schinkel. 
let's hope it's not going to, I mean, it's already very, very tragic what is happening. In a way, it's inappropriate. Here we talk about beauty and the great architect, uh, but uh, not too far away from here, bombs are dropped, uh, you know, on, uh, on, on, on a country which didn't provoke Russia. I like columns, whatever Wolf Priest might say. I, I, I don't like authority in general. And if the column expresses authority, okay, you know, I can understand. Most ban banks in the world have rows of columns. You know, any, any institution which wants to evoke order and the so called, uh, you know, uh, justice, you know, palaces of justice in the world, they all have uh, columns in the front, I mean, uh, you know, all the buildings, um, but, um, you know, uh, it depends. There are columns like here, I, I have nothing against them. I don't think they are, they are, you know, vicious, expressing authority in a crushing and insensitive way. That's because uh, I don't think uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel was such, a, such an architect, you know, to serve authority in a in a pathetically uh, uh, you know submissive way. No, no, he was an artist. You saw he he painted cathedrals. You know uh, these columns are. I, I cannot uh, blame them for being uh, in the service of a authoritarian uh, you know, stance or regime or whatever. No, now in the 19th century and also in the 18th century, there was a, well, not only then, of course, was love, genuine love for the Greek antiquity. So many, you know, Goethe loved it, Winkelmann loved it, everybody loved uh, the antiquity of Greece. So it was a gesture of reverence, employing columns uh, was, uh, was, uh, you know, a, a noble act in the vision of men. I like this museum, yes. I like this museum, but I don't like the New York Stock Exchange, which also uses, um, you know, so-called classical columns. But there I feel it's something very impure, maybe because I know the function of the building. Here is a museum. I don't know if initially it was also a museum. It's, it, it's possible it was. Well, I don't know where this is. It's, I guess inside the museum, this is a self-portrait or uh, yeah, it's an artwork representing Karl Friedrich Schinkel. The Altes Museum. Now, another building by him in Berlin, the Schauspielhaus. Schauspielhaus is a theater from 1825. Um, you know, the, the talent the talent, the sensitivity of an architect, even when he employs so-called classical orders, uh, comes through. That's why, that's why this building, although it has a certain rigidity, and you know, but I, I wouldn't really call it uh, neoclassical in 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 the sense I would other buildings, although it is by all canons, but. I don't know what it is, you know, it's something uh, difficult to pin down, you know, to point out as, um, in a convincing way. Who knows, you know, the way he plays the, the statues here, the, it, there is a certain sensitivity at work, despite the, you know, the symmetry and the classical language he used. 
it's a Prussian architecture. You know, it's, I mean, it has, it's, it's not a Mediterranean architecture, but the architect, in fact, in the, in the, in the, in the, not the poster, the, the invitation I sent out, there was a painting of um, Karl Friedrich Schinkel in a room in uh, Naples, uh, the south of Italy. So, you know, these architects, he was not the only one, but, you know, they loved Italy. They loved the south of Italy. They loved the Mediterranean light, the Mediterranean sea. They, they, they longed for the, for the warmth of that culture. And they brought back to Germany, or he brought back to Germany, something of that. Well, not completely, because you see here certain things that are rather, you know, so-called German. But there are also other things that make the building not oppressively so-called classical. If I am to ask, if I must now to, 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 to uh, you know, justify my statement with, I don't know, maybe even these windows, you know, they are regular, they are rhythmical, but you see, they are dividing, there is a, a slight, not a very strong touch of domesticity, although it's a large, you know, public building. But if you look at the, because he had, and we are going to see a little bit later, uh, he had a domestic side to him, to his architecture. He's not, uh, you know, the corporate man that we talk about these days. He, yes, he created some big buildings, but a man who, well, you could say the Gothic Cathedral was also a big building. Yes, it was, but it was supposed to be the house of God and he only painted it. Uh, uh, by the way of Russia, he also built in Russia and we are going to see And Actually, he built in a very sensitive way and in a, in a, you know, with a small scale uh, building, not a large pompous building. He made this, um, this, this was a drawing done, uh, if not by him uh, uh, during his, his lifetime. But I think it was a uh, uh, rendering uh, done by Schinkel. And it's uh, impeccably drawn. I mean, obviously he knew perspective. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe he had a drafts person in his office. He, I don't think he worked just alone. But at that time, there were no architecture offices like today with 1,600 employees like uh, HOK, Helmut Obama, uh, or, uh, not Obama, Helmut, um, uh, I feel like saying Obama, but it's not Obama. He died at 99 just the other day. Uh, Obata uh, uh, and Casabaum, HOK, they have 1,600 uh, employees. If in, in some other reports I read that 1,800 employees. Can you imagine? Of course, not just in one location, but in one architectural firm. Helmut Obata, Obata and Casabaum. No, in the 19th century, at the most, I think uh, people had a few employees. That's it. Uh, they didn't build uh, skyscrapers. Or did Mr. Putin see this? He's provoking this in the 21st century, if you can believe it. I wonder what will happen uh, during Easter, because it's very possible the war will extend until uh, they reach the time of the Easter. And I wonder if they will continue to bomb and to kill people on Easter. Uh, it's, it's just, it's very sad. It's very sad and incomprehensible to me. Uh, how such people uh, arrive at the position to lead countries, you know? Alte National Gallery. This is the, the, the building on the right side of the Altes Museum. I, 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 uh, I said it twice. So this is another building by Schinkel. Uh, and uh, again, I, I think it's, 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 it's an excellent building. You know, a temple-like. 
uh, and uh, yes, modeled on the Greek uh, example, but uh, different, uh, of course, from the Greek temples. Um, it's it's a well assimilated, well digested antiquity. Uh, these people traveled. They saw things. They had books. They reflected on 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 on, on the meanings of of, of the an, an, of antiquity. And uh, you know they try to connect with the with the glory of of the Greek architecture. He was not the only one. There was this fascination with Greece, but there was also the fascination in his case and in Great Britain uh, much more and and in other countries as well. For example, when I lived in Paris, near where I lived, there was a so-called Gothic cathedral, which I like more than Notre Dame. Notre Dame de Paris didn't move me so much, but uh, uh, this uh, cathedral, which was built in the 19th century, neo-Gothic cathedral, to me seemed more genuine than Notre Dame because Notre Dame was uh, Notre Dame was um, cleaned up for the tourists. It was too whitish, and uh, I, I don't want to be misunderstood now that I only like things which are not clean. No, but. Uh, it seemed to more genuine, strangely, the the copy, you know, way, you know, the Gothic, so-called Gothic cathedral built in the 19th century. And I want to tell you something else, something paradoxical. Somehow in New York City, uh, all the buildings, and they are not so old, of course, because it's the brave new world. But they appear to be all the somehow the 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 spirit of history or of the past. I felt it uh, being more present, uh, of course, with the exception, but more present in New York City than let's say a, a much older European city. The, for example, apartment buildings from uh, the end of the nineteenth century. Maybe in contrast to the new buildings with skyscrapers or whatever, what is old, but actually not so old because it's, uh, you know, the new world, the brave new world, they appear to be older. And they appear paradoxically to evoke um, a more intense involvement with history. I don't know if I explained well now. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is that this museum built in the 19th century by Carl Friedrich Schinkel, uh, could uh, make you feel uh, obliquely and maybe paradoxically more connected with antiquity than the real thing in Greece. For example, I went uh, to the Acropolis and I was near the, the Parthenon, but uh, I'm not sure I had, uh, uh, maybe you could say I, am a, I have a degenerate spirit uh, and that, that could be possible. I hope not, but it, that could be possible. But I, I have, what I want to say, I, I, felt, I felt closer to the Greek antiquity in the proximity of the building by Schinkel than in the, in the proximity of the building uh, on the Acropolis. Well, although here I, I do have to say that there is another temple which is not on the Acropolis, which is from the time of ancient Greece, which I liked much more than the Parthenon. Uh, but uh, the, about this, maybe some other time. Uh, sometimes what is not very famous uh, is, has for me a level of, gen, of uh, uh, being genuine higher. This building is uh, 19th century. So it's, uh, you know, 2000 years approximately you know, newer than what is in Greece. But, uh, you know, uh, while I wouldn't call it Greek uh, antiquity, I wouldn't call it a Greek building, uh, the influence comes from, you know, ancient Greece, but uh, there is something here, maybe, I don't know, the hybridity itself that makes me uh, you know, if not uh, very emotional, but uh, sensitive to what I look at. It's, it's a good building. Maybe because this uh, conjunction between um, the German, the Prussian spirit and the Greek spirit uh, and, uh, you know, through the lens or the hand, uh, you know, the interpretation of Carl Friedrich Schinkel, Schinkel, who did have 
a romantic sensibility. So this building is next to uh, the Altes Museum, a larger building that we just saw. Now, this is a small building, which is also in Berlin, uh, which I hesitate to pronounce because I do not know German, Neuwasche, probably, uh, maybe. Uh, here, again, we see, you know, the Doric columns, um, well, uh, uh, you know, a newer version of the Doric column, um, in a way, a more modern version. Here, I would, I would, I would talk with more ease about neoclassicism to an extent, but only to an extent. And um, this is a building, uh, you know, a smaller building. I don't know what its function was initially. Uh, and uh, we'll see images from the inside. Uh, this building was also uh, beloved by uh, the Nazis. There are pictures with um, soldiers, uh, you know, parading in front of the building. Uh, it's, it's very sad again, and I don't understand why war does not, why war starts to begin with. I don't understand. I don't understand. It's, you know, this, this, this president of Russia has everything, has everything. The biggest country in the world, riches, power, why does he want more? Why? Uh, this is the interior of this Neue Vache with a sculpture by Kathy Kulvitz, uh, very moving, um, you know, statue or sculpture. Um, it's, it's probably connected with, uh, with war and, you know, the loss, uh, loss of lives the mother with the, um, you know, with the, uh, with the, with, with the dead son. As we can see, does Mr. Putin know about this culture or others like this? You know, it's, it's, and I don't understand what his family uh, does or doesn't do. Why don't they, I don't understand, you know, it's, it's, how could this be? I, 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 I'm supposed to talk about Katrin de Schinkel, but I'm, I'm continuously having in my mind the, the, the terrible things that happen at this very moment. So we talk about idealized, um, you know, antiquity, about uh, Greece, about uh, culture, about uh, order, about justice, about beauty, about Zeus, about but the truth of the matter is, uh, I'm afraid Rem Kolkas was right. Human beings do not learn, do not learn anything. We do not learn. It doesn't matter. We go to museums, we read books, but we, we, we have high training. We do not learn. There is a beast in the human being. The Miss van der Rohe competition project for a memorial inside Karl Friedrich Schinkel's Neue Vasche. So you are going to see now the proposal of Miss van der Rohe to create a memorial inside this building by Karl Friedrich Schinkel. This was from 1931. In 1931, Miss was already the director of Bauhaus. As you know, uh, the, the Bauhaus had three directors. The first one was Walter Gropius, who was the founder from 1919 to, I think, 1926, then followed um, uh, Hans Meyer, and then uh, Hans Meyer was dethroned because he was considered the communist and so on, and Mies be became the leader of the Bauhaus for three years. And in 1933, 1934, the Bauhaus dissolved and Mies crossed the ocean, um, uh, went to the United States. But let's look at, this, uh, at his uh, proposal, uh, you know, uh, it's not bad, it's, uh, you know, miss, miss, uh, different miss perhaps a little bit from the one in the United States, but this is a memorial. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's about mourning. It's, 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 it has, uh, you know, darker, darker connotations. 
the, but this is what uh, is now in the present, the sculpture by Kate Kulvitz, uh, 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 a feminine sculptor, a, a woman, a lady, a very good artist. I, I mean, what can we do, you know, what can we do to stop this war in Ukraine? Should we send somehow this picture to Mr. Putin? I don't even know why I use the word Mr. Uh, um, it would be probably useless, useless. It's the same building uh, by, uh, by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. I mean, you know, also I do, what I don't understand, didn't humanity suffer enough because of COVID for two years? Six million people died. Six million people died. I don't understand that Russia also had a large number of deaths and it was confronted and is still confronted with the pandemic. That was not enough. I, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, was it not enough the suffering because of the pandemic? He had to start the war. In a way, these columns are lying. These columns, which are so well balanced and luminous and you know, in a way sensitive and they, they evoke a sense of order, Apollonian order, they lie. We human beings do not deserve these columns. Whether there were wars in Greece, ancient Greece as well, of course, they killed each other because this is what human beings are so good at. We are able to create uh, classical orders, but we are also able to kill uh, our neighbor or our, uh, you know, uh, friend even. These are the human beings. Let's call them human beings inappropriately. No, it, 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 I don't understand. The Schinkel Pavilion, Berlin, 1824. So, you know, almost 200 years ago. It's called the Schinkel Pavilion, it's actually a house. But we can see that this man, look at the plan and compare it, for example, with uh, Villa Rotonda or Villa Capra, uh, Palladio, Andrea Palladio, because this one also has four, uh, inter, you know, four stairs, uh, but in the center is very different. You know, a, a, a Palladio probably would not have done something like this to place in the center a staircase. This building is uh, much more mo uh, modest and domestic than Villa Rotonda or La Rotonda, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a building which would surprise you somehow when you see it from the outside, because it is in a way very, uh, uh, yeah, domestic. Here it is, you know, it, it's a sweet little villa. Uh, it's, it, uh, again, this is the same architect who painted numerous uh, Gothic cathedrals. But this building is certainly not neo-Gothic. It's certainly not aspiring uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, brand by Henry Gibson towards a remote uh, um, uh, God. No, this is a building on the earth for human beings. This is not for God. It's a good building. I personally like it. But it's, a, you know, it's a building with oblongs, um, you know, uh, windows, uh, doors, a little villa. But it's very well, uh, you know, the composition, the, the, it's well proportioned. And this balcony, uh, let's see, is it on, uh, yes, it's around the building, or at least on three sides. But it's interesting, you know, it's... Uh, I don't know what its function was. 
and these. This is also an interesting idea to have oblongs for the doors, the entrance doors. So not only for the windows, but also for the doors. I actually like oblongs, and I think oblongs uh, could could be very very beneficial in the present, uh, uh, even aesthetically. And like you, you can use oblongs in creative ways. You shut off uh, noise. You shut off uh, uh, pollution. You shut off uh, uh, you know uh, questionable uh, lights. Sometimes uh, they are very helpful. And you don't need technology for this. You just need some oblongs. That's it. Car Friedrich Schinger. No, no, he, he was a good architect, and I think his reputation of being one of the best German architects is deserved. You see, this balcony is, is, is very, uh, it's very discreetly uh, built and designed it's not oppressive it's it's actually uh, uh, it shows a, a sensitivity you know it's it's yeah it's it's very discreet it's very light ornaments yes ornaments this is a rendering for the inside of the building. And as you can see, uh, the built uh, interior is, uh, you know, uh, ornamental as well. Not in an abusive way or excessive way, but uh, there are gestures of ornamental nature and the color i don't know if if this was the original uh, you know uh, chromatic scheme of the building with this uh, maybe it was i imagine it was he was a painter after all this is his uh, portrait here um i guess it's an art uh, museum a smaller museum here right now Well, it's possible these are his creations because it's called the Schinkel Pavilion. And it's possible uh, these pieces of furniture by him and also, you know, his uh, uh, projects for furniture. It's possible, yes. Now, another church, Friedrichs Werders, Werders Kirche. This is a uh, the closest he came to being neo-Gothic, but uh, you know, still, uh, if you compare what he built here with his paintings, you realize that uh, he was much more exalted in the painting. And this is in a way explainable. It's always easier to be exalted in painting than in, um, uh, you know, in, uh, it seems he's not very far away from uh, the Altes Museum, which is here. Now, it seems this one became a kind of a museum too, no? Maybe temporarily, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the presence of statues inside the, 
the the church seems to say that yes but this happens often in uh, you know in the catholic uh, religion um, you know they invite art in very often sometimes uh, abstract art modern art sure as opposed to the the orthodox church which uh, would, would not have something like this i don't know for how long we will continue to stubbornly say no to our own life our own culture Carl Friedrich Schinker. Well, if he lived for other 30 years, like uh, Frank Gehry, uh, he probably would have uh, built much more uh, and many, many, many other interesting buildings. This is a chapel built in Russia, uh, the Alexander Nevsky Chapel, which I like, is this building. And yes, it has a, I think he captured something of, uh, of uh, of the spirit of, of Russian Russian churches, Russian chapels, although this is done by a German. It's nice. Karl Friedrich Schinkel in, in Russia. The Alexander Nevsky Chapel. Now we arrive at the castle, Schloss's castle, the chateau. We, yesterday we saw the, um, the gardens ar ar around the, the castle, the chateau of France uh, by uh, André Le Nôtre. And today we look now at the, at the castle by uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel. I'm not a great admirer of castles. I find them rather distant, you know, I mean, but he built a castle, of course, uh, and uh, here it is. It does look like a castle, of course, maybe too much so. Now here uh, we cannot talk any longer about the neoclassical or, or neoclassicism. There is something else here. Um, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, I, I find its architecture a little bit problematic, uh, you know, a little bit too sweet and, you know, to make a sweet fortress is uh, paradoxical, it's uh, oxymoronic, but that's how, to me, it looks like a little bit, you know, like a stage design in Hollywood for some, uh, some, for some film. Sorry, Schinkel, I don't try to diminish in any way. Uh, your greatness, but uh, maybe, I mean, inside I see some interesting things, but from the outside, it looks a little bit, uh, again, a, a sweet fortress, a schloss, a castle. Yeah, we also see some kind of leaning towards the medieval uh, world. You know, it's, uh, they didn't have castles, uh, you know, in ancient Greece. I mean, not castles in, in, in the way we, we know them in Europe. A castle is for a nobleman and, uh, you know, the family of a nobleman. Uh, it's, uh, it's a function which cannot exist any longer. And it's also useless. Imagine, uh, uh, you know, this a castle was built on top of a hill, you know, uh, fortress-like, uh, you know, being uh, protected and or easily uh, 
I mean, uh, being protected or uh, or uh, having the capacity to 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 be protected. Uh, but uh, what do you do today when a, a, a bomber, a Russian or otherwise, would fly above the um, you know the poor uh, Schloss, the the poor castle? Is uh, you know uh, we we'll look at the buildings at the bottom and look at the castle. You know now in ancient times or not ancient in all the times. Here was the nobleman, and then less fortunate people lived at the bottom. Uh, but uh, but now they are both immensely fragile. I mean, the castle is uh, doesn't matter how uh, you know imposing it looks. Uh, like uh, again, uh, with modern technology, we can transform this into ashes in a matter of seconds. So. Nikolai Church in Potsdam, also in Germany. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, again, this is not what he depicted in his paintings, the, the, the Gothic, Gothicist uh, cathedrals. It's, but it's interesting because, yes, he has elements of, uh, of uh, neoclassicism, but also these corners with these little, uh, you know, uh, this pointing the little uh, roofs. Uh, it's, it's something here a little bit hybrid. So it's not, that's why I wouldn't call him a neoclassical architect. Now, he, he interpreted, he changed. He, there was a metamorphosis of all the styles that he adapted according to his sensitivity. He likes symmetry, obviously. Even here we see four uh, turrets uh, in the corner of the building. The center is uh, center, all right. I mean, it's, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, what is happening at the White House in, in Washington. It's, it's impressive and, and big. So this is in Potsdam. Now we have a, we, we can take a look at the interior. Sorry, I, I wish I had more pictures of it with it, but I don't. Okay, now another church in Berlin. Now this man built a lot in Berlin. Um, now, yes, this, this one, but you see, it's not, it's called a church, but it's more temple-like. Its architecture is more temple-like. So you wonder, you know, in what way the Gothic loving Karl Friedrich Schinkel understood the sacred. Because you, could not, you, you cannot say that this is a Christian church. You know, it, it's more temple-like. And it's even more surprising when you consider his painted work with those uh, majestic and uh, uh, exalted uh, Gothic uh, cathedral or Gothicist cathedrals. Interesting man, interesting architecture. Again, uh, the, the, the effects of war, probably, um, but uh, you know, the interior, they kept it. Well, I guess the exterior was, um, you know, made uh, acceptable somehow. And the interior was left, at least in this picture, uh, as it was affected by the deadly Second World War. Um, again, why is, anyway, uh, I, I read that actually Biden uh, told uh, Putin uh, you don't have a soul. And Putin replied, apparently, we understand each other. I actually find the reply of, of Putin, if indeed this was his reply, rather uh, subtle, uh, well, cynically subtle, and in a way uh, with a certain level of um, you know, intelligence. You know, uh, indirectly, he told Biden, you are also soulless. 
I keep coming back to this because I cannot I cannot forget uh, what is happening not far away from where we are. I just cannot forget. Uh, these are uh, you know modern uh, sculptures by uh, important Serbian uh, uh, artist Abramovic. Abramovic. Um, so you know art is brought in, and I think. I think the Catholic Church, the Western Church is doing the correct thing, somehow is rediscovering that uh, equation, that, that, uh, that uh, initial uh, connection between art and religion, which was expressed in the etymology, the oldest etymology of the word art that I found, or the oldest definition of art, art equals bridge equals God. And both Rodin, I kept saying this, uh, sorry if uh, one of you or several, well, one of you heard me about this before, but both Ingmar Bergman and Auguste Rodin said the same thing. At the beginning, art and religion were one because art was a form of worship. That was the raison d'etre of art. And uh, in later times, in modern times, in I don't know when exactly, you know, maybe after the Renaissance, gradually art divorced itself from religion. And both Rodin, a great, great sculptor, and Ingmar Berman, a great, great film uh, director, they both said the same thing. When religion and art became divorced from each other, they both died. And maybe the Western church consciously or unconsciously uh, they by bringing art back into the church and contemporary art maybe it tries to 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 create again that that connection that initially was the very root of both bring together art and architect and art and religion and they do it courageously you know avant-garde theater avant-garde art uh, you know, like here, bravo to them. I wish something like this would happen in, in our country as well, but uh, there are no signs at all in that direction. In our case, uh, art and religion are uh, violently um, uh, divorced because the art that the so-called art that the, the churches in our country display is not the art of our time. No, it's, it's just a dogmatization of art. And uh, thus it is not art because uh, dogmatized art is not art. These people are creating here uh, in accordance with our time. And uh, what I see here to me is very impressive. It doesn't matter the building is, uh, you know, unadorned or, uh, you know, uh, uh, affected by time. I find it uh, very moving. Now the Nazareth church in Berlin, another, well, this one looks more like a church, but it's, it's you know, cubistic uh, and it's uh, has a level of austerity. If he didn't have this rose window here, and these um, doors like this, I mean, he could have, this, this could have been easily uh, uh, transformed uh, into a, you know, modern uh, modern church and interpretation. It's still very simple and, and, and you know, rather austere. And, uh, you know, the reference to the uh, antique uh, ancient, ancient temple is still here. I think Schinkel, despite being an architect of the 19th century, also announced, you know, indirectly and maybe subtly or, or maybe, uh, you know, the, not uh, strident, stridently, um, you know, modernity. I mean, this building, uh, you know, it's uh, in its simplicity uh, has a certain level of modernity. Now, the Charlottenhof Palace in Potsdam, uh, this is not a schloss, it's not a castle, but a palace. It was refurbished, it's cleaned up. Schinkel, 
Schinkel again. Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Now, an interesting work, a tent, a tent room. I don't know for whom it was, for whom it was built or constructed. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good work in my opinion, because in its fragility being a tent, a different kind of sensibility is at work here. Now, I don't know if he designed also the fabrics, uh, but uh, it, it, well, it's a room, it's a tent, but it's also a room you see with a wooden floor and with a window. Uh, if it was not built for a king or, uh, you know, but I imagine it was built for, uh, you know, uh, an elite, uh, you know, high ranking uh, official, if not the king uh, himself and the queen. Um, I don't know what uh, what they had at that time in the you know first half of the 19th century. I like it because it's this mixture, and I think there are suggestions here for a, a possible architecture which combines the you know the solidity the, the of uh, built uh, room or built uh, house with uh, with the fragility. Uh, and the temporalness of um, of textile work, and uh, you know, it's, it's something to reflect on. If you could make an architecture which is both stable and unstable, or permanent and and, and temporary, you know, combine the, the 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 solid aspects of architecture with a certain level of fragility, like a tent has. But this is a large tent, of course. But I like it, you know. It's it's um, it's also a, 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 an intersection in a way of two cultures, you know, the the European Western culture, and you know maybe the Arab culture. You know that the tent uh, is, um, I think, a, a viable actually uh, um, solution, perhaps even for. Uh, at times of when we, we are, you know, confronted with uh, sustainability problems and so on. I would consider the, the, the tent and study it and who knows, in may, maybe some interesting architectures could emerge from uh, <clears throat> the inspiration coming from, uh, from the tent. Now I, I, I lend the presentation showing, I don't know, I usually show the drawings at first, at the beginning, but here I have them towards the end. I I might show also some furniture I forgot, but uh, let's look at his renderings. Because he was a painter, he was a drafts person, he was uh, an artist. He also uh, drew a lot and uh, his uh, renderings are, uh, you know, impeccable. I mean, you know, imagine how much work was put into this rendering. I don't know if he did it alone or he had some, um, you know, people helping him, but, uh, you know, just to render one of those statues, forget about the whole ambiance and the whole room. And these are uh, not for specific projects, I imagine. They are just uh, idealized, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision, so to speak. They idealized, uh, um, you know, versions of possible uh, architectures that he imagined. Now, maybe this was done, uh, although it's different from what we saw at the Altes Museum, but uh, who knows, maybe, you know, a variation on that theme. Again and again, the drawing has importance in architecture, even if you do not build, but you can, express yourself through a project, through a drawing. Even if it's not a proje project for a specific task, for a specific um, you know, space or place, uh, you can still express your, what you believe in, what you feel architecture should be and could be through drawings. You don't need a client for this. Like this here, you know, nobody commissioned him, you know, this kind of uh, idealized, um, you know, architectural setting clearly influenced by uh, ancient Greece. No, uh, he did it because he loved architecture and he loved to dream. 
and uh, you know uh, those who those who in the name of so called reality kill the vision of the architect or 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 or, or arrest it do a terrible disservice to architecture we should allow and encourage any architect to express his or her visions as courageously as possible you know uh, i mean again this is a major architect in germany in the 19th century who built a lot and we saw buildings built by him who also express himself you know uh, graphically uh, in uh, what some might call fantasies but these fantasies are important you know they are important for uh, expressing you know the, the 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 visions of the architect so he did it through paintings of uh, you know gothic or neo-gothic cathedrals he also did it uh, through architectural projects, which were not uh, destined to be built. Uh, this is a drawing he did for, uh, you know, uh, uh, Campidoglio in Rome. Uh, we know here the, the, the square uh, where Michelangelo worked. I guess it's a drawing he did uh, upon visiting Rome. Then this is a stage design. He worked also for the theater, uh, other renderings, in this case, perhaps for uh, you know, a building which was supposed to be built, and it was built actually, maybe not quite like this. The, the building that was built and we, we saw it with a sculpture by Kate Kulwitz at the interior. A very rich life, no? So this man manifested his uh, longings, his aspirations, his dreams, uh, his uh, talent through drawings, through painting, through building. This is an architect, and this is what an architect is supposed to do. Not to be the slave of Homo economicus, not to become a businessman, you know, architecture is one thing and, uh, you know, business is another. And uh, we should understand this. If this man was a businessman, he would not have drawn what we look at now. No. You know, what businessman would spend here? I mean, again, just to render this column, you know, you would need some time. You know, even if you are very rigorous German architect, you need some time not to speak about drawing and uh, painting uh, every leaf of the trees and uh, the, the sculptures. He worked without doubt here, you know, a long time for just for this rendering. And he has many. He loved architecture, he loved art. What can you do? This is what an architect is supposed to do, to love art and architecture or architecture and art and above all life. Yes. And nature, of course, nature. This is rather strange. What is this? You know, this just the top of a building uh, planted, uh, you know, uh, springing directly from the earth. And then this is these are uh, you know imaginings of Carl Friedrich Schinkel, like this uh, rendering as well, or this um, you know the drawing. You know, uh, it makes me think almost a little bit of although Lebia Suits was a very different kind of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, architect in his imaginings, but he also, I mean, you know, this was not built, was not maybe even buildable, you know, he, it was him dreaming about architecture, incorporated inside the, incorporating inside the huge uh, uh, rocky mountain, uh, you know, the work of man. And uh, why did he do it? Because he, he had the, um, you know, architectural uh, visions. Domestic or not so domestic, ambitious or not so ambitious. Uh, you know, the, we saw the room, the tent room that was built. Here is a rendering of it. And he drew everything and is actually almost identical with what was built.
I end this presentation, I think, with this, the stage design for the magic flute by Mozart, the hall of stars in the palace of the queen of the night, act one, scene six, from 1847 to 1849. So two important uh, artists, we can call Mozart an artist too, although he was a composer and musician. And this is the, you know, this is the stage design for the, the magic flute by Mozart, done by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. And in my opinion, despite the fact that it is, uh, you know, rather, well, figurative in a way, at least there is the human silhouette there. But I think the, the stage design, if you do it, if it, if, if it was done these days, it will, it will still be impressive. You know, because the vastness of the of the sky, of the heavens, of cosmos, is evoked very well here, and the human being is just uh, you know reduced to a to a minimum. So why why did I say what I said? Because I think the modernity of Carl Friedrich Schinkel is an aspect which we shouldn't ignore. Art, as Charles Baudelaire said, has two halves. One half speaks about what is permanent, about the eternal, the immutable, and the other half speaks about the, the transitory, the ephemeral, uh, the temporary. So art, and I think Charles Baudelaire was right, art has both halves and you need both. So the permanent side of the work of Carl Friedrich Schinkel is relevant to us as well, 200 years later, or almost 200 years later. So let's wish him happy birthday, Mr. Um, uh, Schinkel. Thank you. <laughs>